In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, Richard Stamen and I, we will be uncovering some of the top mid-major sleeper prospects that will be playing at conference tournaments this week. Stay tuned. Big, big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I am your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board, and my co-host for today is my guy, Richard Stamen. We haven't done an episode together in a little while, so this is fun. And actually, I thought of this topic because the one that we did last year was great, and Richard hit the nail on the head on a couple of prospects. So this episode should be fun. But before we get into this episode, I want to let you know that it is brought to you by Prize Picks, which is the easiest and the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA, but you have to use all lowercase on locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. And if you're not subscribed, please subscribe, like, share, comment. Make sure you click the bell so you can be notified every time we post because we are your source for NBA draft content five days a week. Richard, what is going on, my man? Hey, it's been a minute, and I uh, appreciate you remembering the Jalen Slauson hype. That was, uh, that was a fun time. Yeah, I was definitely familiar with him, but there were a couple names that, that you mentioned in that episode, but then Slauson followed it up with a big game against Virginia. I mean, that was the NCAA tournament, but I figured, hey, let's let's get these mid-major guys. Let's talk about them early before they hit the NCAA tournament because maybe not all of them will make it, but for the fans out there that are looking for some sleeper prospects for their teams, this episode will, will be fun. So let's, let's talk about who is – your favorite or the top mid-major prospect that is still alive in conference tourneys right now? Yeah, I I hesitate to use Gonzaga as a mid-major. If they count, though, I mean, I love what they've been doing. They haven't lost in almost a month. Uh, Nolan Hickman has been absolutely on a tear. Anton Watson, I think, is the best prospect on the team. He's been on a tear. It's really consistent for him. And then even Ryan Nemhart as well, who transferred out from Creighton. All those guys have been doing really well. So I'd say probably Anton Watson's Anton Watson probably my number one left uh, of the mid-majors. Again, I know Gonzaga's like a cheap mid-major, yeah. but at the same time, he, he's a really nice player. The, obviously, he has concerns, but I think there are some really valuable elements to his game. It's been a quiet year. Like, they haven't had Timmy. They have, haven't had Chet or, or, or Jalen Suggs. None of like the big name prospects or first round guys. And it's kind of been under the radar how successful they've been this season. Hickman was, you know, a guy that some people thought was going to be a one and done after well, coming into his freshman season. And then you look at Nimhard, who transferred from Creighton. I st still don't know if that was like the best decision, at least personally. You know, maybe I'm a little biased because. I'm from Omaha and I root for Creighton, but I thought it was kind of like a lateral move. I didn't think it was like a move where he made like a significant increase in his role. Last time I looked was maybe like a couple of weeks ago. The numbers are almost identical to, to what they were at Creighton. And then Watson is a guy that you've been a fan of for, for a while. As far as Watson, where do you see him as an NBA prospect? Yeah, I, I think he's the ultimate connector forward. He's in that weird range of like, he's not a big man. He's also not a wing. So, and he's not like a power forward. Uh, so he's very much a tweener, not always the best ways on offense, especially because we don't know how good the shot is, but it has improved that the shot looks good. I think there's a lot to like, and he can guard multiple positions. I think he's super smart on defense too. So I think there's just a lot to like with his game. Just being that ultimate connector He's around six, eight has a decent frame. Again, he's super smart, and I think that has value in the league. Draft pick, two-way, exhibit 10. What what would you say your your range is for him? He's, he's the back end of the second round, uh, I think, which, honestly, if you're the back end of the second round, you're a two-way prospect. And I think he'll graduate from that very easily, though. Yeah, I think anywhere after maybe 35 might be a two-way, which 
It's like you're hearing your name called, but you're you're pretty much in the same position as guys that that didn't get drafted. And then there also are some benefits to not getting drafted, where you can pick the situation that fits best for you. All right, who is another prospect that is on a mid major, not a cheap mid major, but a, a real mid major? <laughs> yeah, more. That, this one's obviously like the real. This is the Big West. This is somebody we talked about in the preseason, but AJ Mitchell over at UCSB um, Santa Barbara. I think they've got a really nice team. They're not, I don't think they're the favorite to come out of the big West, if I'm not mistaken, but he is still alive at the, at least at the time of recording this. And they also have somebody else who's really interesting. I don't, I don't know if he's an NBA guy, but he's still interesting at the least uh, former Auburn commit or freshman. Now sophomore, obviously he's at um, UCSB Johan Traore, who's yeah. been interesting to watch again, probably not an NBA guy, but, just interesting to see how he develops. Yeah, you see Santa Barbara. I I feel like their season has been a major disappointment. I mean, they're they're sixteen and fourteen, and I mean, I, I like Mitchell. I mean, what he had thirty seven his last game. Yeah, he's he's one of my my favorite players in this class. I have him as a first round pick. I don't. I mean, in this draft, I don't see too many guys that are like shot creators like him. My ideal situation for him is the Denver Nuggets. Like that is the perfect team for him where he doesn't necessarily have to be a one or a two. He can just be a ball player, maybe get some of those Reggie Jackson minutes. So I would love to see him go there, maybe even a team like Philly. But I'm a a big A.J. Mitchell fan. And like I said, he's in my first round. Yeah, I I have – not a concern, but it is weird to me that, I mean, he's got like, they're not the most talented team, of course, or anything, but they're kind of almost, they just didn't stand out in the big West. Yeah. And I do wonder in a league where I like, can just college basketball is so guard driven. It is interesting to me that they didn't win as much. And I wonder how much that's going to hurt his draft stock. I don't I'm not saying one way or another for myself, but I do think it is something teams will question. Yeah, I mean, I, I could see that. But if you watch the, the film and see his game, and we're talking about a guy that's averaging like 19 a game. He shot over 50% from the floor three consecutive seasons. The concern or knock on him prior to this year was that he just wasn't an efficient three-point shooter. He's up to 38% this year, but you would like to see it on a, a larger volume, only two attempts per game from three. But he gets to the foul line six times per game. She was 85% from the foul line. And he's just so good at getting to the basket and getting to his spots that he really doesn't need to shoot threes. Now, I, I think that it will need to increase, you know, on the next level. But he's such a gifted scorer. And, I mean, I've heard some people say, is he a one? Is he a two? Is he a tweener? But I just think he's a, a ball player. And I'm big on guys that just – are for lack of a better term, ball players that are positionless. You can play them at the one, you can play them at the two. But like I said, I, I may be biased. I have him as a top 30 guy. So I really like him a lot. All right, give me give me another guy that that you you feel like is a a, a sleeper that the casual fan that maybe hasn't watched a lot of in major basketball would they need to know about. Yeah. So this is somebody who I've seen for years. And I know you've actually I think you know him personally is Isaiah Crawford at uh, Louisiana Tech. He's he's really interesting because he's got a ridiculously just long frame. He's about 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, mm -hmm. give or take an inch each way, with probably seven-foot wingspan, and he's got like all the defensive stats you want. He has almost four combined steals and blocks a game. His jump shot's taken a step this year, 41% from three. You had 42% the year before. He really finally looks healthy. And looks that part of when he was a freshman, I remember people are calling him like a baby Kawhi archetype. He's obviously not baby Kawhi in the NBA, but he is somebody who you, when you have that archetype and you have success in college, you have an easier path to finding minutes in the NBA. Yeah. My comparison would be like OG, the role that OG and an Anobi plays. Yeah. I like that more. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm glad that he's healthy. He's. I think he still has another year if he wants to Probably. use it. Just because I know one of the years was a red shirt year because he got injured early on. I spoke with his dad recently on, on. It was just on social media, and he had told me that that um, you know, he he wants to go pro. He doesn't want to necessarily do another another year of school. 
But, you, I mean, you never know. I mean, it's almost like if you have another year of school – and I mean, he won conference player of the year. He he could have some options at some bigger schools that could be pretty lucrative. So maybe he's just over the whole college life and he's ready to get on and be a pro. But he's definitely a sleeper that I feel like is going to be a two way guy and is going to creep and crawl his way up into a team's rotation because he can defend. He has the body to play or, or defend multiple positions. And he can shoot. He's shooting 40% from three. And so he's like the perfect, like complimentary piece to a to a team that needs guys to, to to surround their superstar. All right. When we return, we're gonna talk about a few more prospects that are playing in mid-major conferences at their conference tournament that you could see them on NBA rosters next year. But let's talk about eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. It is what brings home the winning trophy, and it is also what keeps your car alive. And eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle. You can level it up to peak performance with superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. That's because they have over 122 million parts to choose from. So you'll always find exactly what you are looking for. And with the eBay Guaranteed Fit, the part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or you will get your money back. That's because with eBay Motors, you are burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it is easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com, eligible items only, and exclusions apply, and that's because the eBay Guaranteed Fit it is only available to U.S. customers. As you know, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24 hours a day, seven days a week streaming channel, which is called Locked On Sports Today. And if you are a baseball fan, mark your calendars for March 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern for the best Major League Baseball season preview coming exclusively to Locked On Sports today on March 20th at 7 o'clock Eastern. Be the first to get local insight from the Major League Baseball local experts of the Locked On Podcast Network. So find it again March 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern on the Locked On Sports Today, 24 hours a day, seven days a week streaming channel, which is on YouTube or free on Amazon Fire TV, the Amazon Fire TV channels app. All right, once again, this is Rafael Barlow with Richard Stamen. We're talking about mid-major guys to pay attention to that are NBA prospects that are playing in mid-majors. Well, Gonzaga is, you know, it's a mid-major by conference, but they are definitely a power five program. We've talked about Anton Watson, a little bit about Nolan Hickman. Talked about A.J. Mitchell, who I'm a big fan of. We talked about Isaiah Crawford, who I think could be the 2024 NBA draft version of OG Ananobi. Who's next? Like, who is another prospect that you believe could make some noise? So before I go into it, are we counting the Mountain West as mid-major? Because they've been really good this year. Yeah. Okay, cool. I really like all of New Mexico. Their whole team is just fascinating. J.T. Toppin. Donovan Dent, I think I like Dent the most, and then Jalen House, who's Eddie House's son. Uh, I really like all three of those guys. JT Toppin needs to work on his jump shot to really stick, but Donovan Dent is that guy for me. He's a two-way guard, great playmaking. The jumper looks projectable. I'm just a huge fan of his game. I have him top 60 on my board if he were to declare this year. I think Donovan Dent is the best passer in college basketball. Yeah. And JT Toppin, a Dallas kid, is getting some NBA buzz. Like I, I've been hearing his name, you know, kind of buzzing that that he's a guy that NBA teams like. Whether it's this year or next year, he does have some fans in, in front offices. New Mexico's is it's a fun team to watch. I know you were big on house coming into the season. And he's he's I, I think that. I think he's had a good year, maybe not the year that some expected, but I also think part of that could be because Toppin has 
caught a lot of people by surprise, but I'm a huge Donovan Dent fan. Like the the passes that he makes, I could see him being a rotation guard in the NBA. And I think he's going to thrive in the pro setting because it fits his game as far as with spacing and, and pick and rolls. And I could just see him as a guy. I don't know if he's going to be a starter, but a guy that can come in and run your team and and just make the players around him better, especially if it's a, a role man. Yeah, it, it's funny with Donovan Den. I never expected him to take this jump this year. I saw him when he came through SMU last year and I I really wanted to see Jalen House. That was the guy. And, but Jalen House has taken a little bit of a step backwards. His efficiency went down. I, I just don't think he really found a way to impact winning as much as I would have liked him to. Obviously, it's tough to say with he's on the one of the best teams in all of uh, the Mountain West, which has been a good conference. But he could have been a lot better. Like, he left so much on the table. He's dropped for me, even though I still think he's kind of Alvarado. But with Donovan Dent, I mean, man, you just look at the defense is what really sold me on him. It wasn't actually the offense until this year where we've seen so many smooth pick and rolls with him. And it, it's really fascinating. I mean, just the playmaking defense combo. And I really buy the jump shot, too. So I just I feel like he's an NBA player. I don't care that he's six one. He impacts winning at such a high level. And like you said, he makes everyone else around him better on both ends. Like that is a dream point guard, I feel like. Yeah, I sometimes just the fan in me just turns off evaluation mode and I just watch his passes. I go on synergy and I just watch his assists and just to see how creative some of his passes are. And it's almost like it's not showboaty flashy. It's just he sees it and he makes these pick and roll passes at, at these different angles. I mean, he's he's fun to watch. Yeah, I mean, dude, it's all within the flow of the offense. Like that's what it is. It's not – there are definitely guys that like at any level of basketball that wait till they can get the flashy pass off. It's like you said, it's, it's right there. He sees the pocket pass, like being open. He will get it. He might throw a nice little, like almost sidearm bounce pass, but he's going to get it there accurately and efficiently. Like it's, it's not out of the way. Crazy. Yeah. He reminds me of, and I had mentioned it in a previous podcast. I went to Madrid. I think it was in September and I really wanted to see like, how different their development is with, with Spanish players because you can't name like a Spanish point guard or even big that wasn't like a creative passer. And one of the things that they focus on in, in Spain is that not a lot of individual stuff, a lot of teamwork stuff, but the key to their success is passing, but they also practice the fastest pass. Like there's really not a such thing as a fundamental pass. So they're like, if the fastest pass to get from point A to point B is a sidearm pass, that's what they work on hook pass. I, it was pretty cool to watch the, the, like some of the younger teams. And I even went to girls and boys practices. They do like the three on two, two on one drills. And sometimes the pass has to be an underhand scoop pass. Sometimes the pass has to be a touch pass. They just work on so many variations of passes in their three on two, two on one, like conditioning drills that it's just natural to see some guys throwing these wild passes. And Dent reminds me of some of like the, the Spanish point guards with their flair on the pick and roll, because like you said, it's a sidearm pass. It's, it's just these very creative angles to get it to, to the role, man. And as a big, I mean, he has to be one of your favorite guys to play with. And I have this, this theory, right? If I were, if I were like a a big man top prospect, like one of the top prospects, like if I were Cooper Flag or or Maluch going to Duke, I would say if Donovan Dent <laughs> is not going to the draft, figure out a way to get him here because he is going to make me look good as a finisher. And so if I were like a, a a big man, of course, it depends on if he decides to test the waters or not. And of course, you know, New Mexico fans don't want to hear this at all. But if I'm a big man, I'm either transferring there and I'm trying to attach my game to him because he can make me look good. That's how good of a passer he is. So I'm I'm really, really high on him. All right. When we return, we'll wrap up the last segment and we'll talk about a few more mid-major prospects to look out for in conference tourneys, guys that could, you know, 
you you can find them on some NBA rosters next year. But let's talk about our sponsor for today, which is Prize Picks, which is also America's number one fantasy sports app with over three million members. Prize Picks is growing by the day. And it is the easiest and the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It is just you against the numbers. You pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you can watch the money roll in. And it is demon time on prize picks. You can now win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into 1000 I actually saw a guy post. He got three out of four picks right, and I think he put like, I forgot what it was, but I think he could have won like $10,000 or something like that. So anyway, Demons and Goblins are the newest and the most exciting way to play at prize picks. Squares marked with red demons or green goblins get you different payouts. You can now win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. 100 times your money. I think that's exactly what the guy was playing, why he was so frustrated that he just missed out. So, again, you can win up to 100 times your money. All you have to do is go to prizepicks.com slash LockedOnNBA and use the promo code LockedOnNBA, but it has to be in all lowercase for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, prizepicks.com slash LockedOnNBA. Do you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer from the other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% match on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC, member of SIPC, is a registered broker dealer. All right, last segment, we've talked about some mid-major guys from A.J. Mitchell, Donovan Dent, Isaiah Crawford. I want to ask you about Jadon Ladee. What are your thoughts on him? He's having a monster season at San Diego State. It's like 20 points, eight rebounds. I just don't understand how a guy that talented and that productive doesn't get major burn at Ohio State and TCU. I feel like both teams could use him right now. They just didn't play him to his strengths. Yeah, I. Uh, it's funny. If you want to feel old, uh, and it is puts in perspective. Just, I mean, he's going to be 25 in by right. really like at the by the time yes. summer league ends. I think it's somewhere yep. around there. To put it in perspective, because I remember seeing him at TCU when I first started covering like TCU and everything, and then his name just started popping up, and I'm like, "There's no way this is the same guy." Because he was really bouncy. He was really athletic. He would make a few plays. Like, if you watch TCU now, it's a very deep cut. But the way Xavier Cork plays, he played the exact same role, that energy big. And I was like, okay, like, there's – he's nice. Like, you watch him in warm-ups, and he looks like one of the best players on the team with his athleticism. He was shooting a little. But he didn't start shooting until this year. So it's really interesting for me. My question is, were the first four years of his career a real sign of who he was and this is an outlier? Or is this everything that we saw in terms of the talent that he has? Is he finally putting it together? And that's kind of where I'm struggling because he's very old for the draft. I mean, like I said, he'll be 25 during training camp. Or you really only have one year to prove yourself when you're going to be 26 in your second year. It's very tough unless you have that elite skill to hang your hat on. And I'm not sure he does. But 
I do think there is something to be said for the fact that he can do so much of everything that it makes everyone else around him better. Yeah, I've had a chance to talk with him and just kind of hear his story. He was, I remember he was highly touted out of Houston back when I was like doing AAU. And if I'm not mistaken, he was in the same class with like Terrence Ferguson and, and, and some of those guys, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, if he, he's 25, that, that puts him around maybe what? I think he was the year after because he, he was class of 2018. Okay, so I guess he was years. two years. But I, well, he yeah. was definitely playing around that around that. They time played of, together. Yeah, yeah. And so, I think he had like a really good. He had some flashes at Ohio State, and the story that I've heard is that because of his size, they just kind of played him at the five. When he always had like he 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 was groomed to be a point guard, and then as he outgrew and got bigger and bigger, he was kind of like a the way he's playing now is how he played in high school, but in college, they just kind of played him at the five and kind of boxed him in. And then even last year at, at San Diego state, you didn't really get a chance to see everything that he has. And then this year, because they need him so much, they've really unleashed him and he didn't make a single three pointer in his career until this year. And he's at, he's at 38%. I mean, he's getting to the foul line. He's, he's shown that he can pass face up. I mean, he's been a matchup nightmare all season long. I do think there is a way that his age could be an advantage more so to a team than him in a sense, because if you, you know, you give him a two way or whatever, he's 25, you have, somewhat of an experienced rookie, he is going to have to to make an adjustment to the NBA game. But you're getting a guy that he could be at his prime years while on his rookie deal. So you can get him for for really cheap and considering that he's probably more he, he's probably more ready to contribute than a lot of guys that could be first round picks. Now I, I do think that you know it's going to be a, a special fit but maybe even a team like Denver. I mean, they've had they have a reputation for taking guys that are, that are a little older. I mean, Peyton Watson was, was pretty young, but they may be looking for somebody that can possibly come in and contribute right away. I do think that there is a world where he can play. I mean, you look at Trey Jemison for Memphis. I mean, of course, there's been a lot of injuries, but he's starting and he's played well. He didn't average ten points a game in college. I mean, of course, he's he's a seven footer, but I do think that. There is a, a a world where where, where, where Lede can play this season or play next season and contribute. And like I say, a team could get a guy that's a veteran on, on a rookie on a rookie minimum deal for two to three years. Yeah, my worry is just I don't know what he position he plays. So like, does he shoot enough to be a four five? Like to distinctively be one of those, and he's six nine. That's kind of where my concern is. is he's going to have to take that massive uptick in shooting right away. Like I said, like he just doesn't have time to really slip up at all. And that really worries me. Like if he's not able to shoot and make two threes a game with teams contesting him or really respecting him, it's going to be really tough. I, I think he's going to be bound for like a two way. Obviously, like should be his range, by the way. Like it's worth gambling on him and seeing, hey, is he is he anything? And from there, like that's up to him. But, you know, I don't know if he gets drafted per se. Yeah, I don't know if he'll get drafted because of his age. Yeah. But in, in my mind, I'm thinking, like, why couldn't he play the same role that Trace Jackson Davis is playing? Yeah, I think Trace is just such a better passer. I think it's really the big needle mover for me. And I, I think Ladie is a good passer. Like he's, Yeah, but, uh, but Trace was I, like... Not, he's not Trace. Yeah. But... I think he's a good passer. I think he may have more. I think Ladie may have more face up game. I, and so, and then he's actually shooting. <laughs> I mean, by default, because Trace doesn't shoot. But I, I do think it's going to take a, a situation like that where he may go to a team that has a bunch of guys making a lot of money and you have to fill out the back end of the roster with cheap guys and then it may take an injury or something like that and then boom he, he's in the rotation but I do think there is a world for him to where he can come in and contribute to a team that's fair yep is there any other player that one more okay 
One more. Sorry to I cut you off. I think you've been saving this. I think you've been saving this guy. Yeah, I, I realized I, I was like, wait, I, I didn't. I completely like, even though I've seen this team in person against the Big 12, I keep forgetting Houston is in the Big 12. So I'm like, oh, the American Athletic Conference isn't a mid major. It actually, like, by most metrics, is a true mid major of like ninth, 10th best conference. So it has fallen off. And because of that, David Jones at Memphis qualifies. You want to talk about somebody? We're talking about somebody that can contribute right away. I mean, I've talked to people that, you know, are very close with some of these programs in the American athletic, like parents of players and stuff. And every single one of them always asks me, they go, why is David Jones not on any draft boards? And I get it. There are some past concerns, whatever, but I feel like he's addressed so much of that. He's, he's a little bit more disciplined on defense. Still would like to see some improvement there, but he's so good at timing the steals that I almost don't hate it. And then he's improved just to some of his shot selection as well. I just think his scoring and defense, I think there's a lot of potential there. 38% from three, 21 points a yep. game. Here's a question for you. Is he the best NBA prospect on that team? I need to think about that. Na- Na- remember, Naquan Tomlin is on that team now. Yeah, I, I've never been a big Tomlin fan. I was thinking, I, I thought I was missing someone else. I, I've never been huge on Tomlin personally. Um, I get the uh, appeal because like the Kansas State run last year was really nice, but... He's raw, just started playing. Yeah, and I get it. He shoots, like, I, I know, and he's big, but I just worry he's a little bit too theoretical. I think you can plug in, like, maybe I'm just valuing now over long term on this. I just think you can plug and play David Jones for the next two, three years so much better than you can with Tomlin. I think Naquan Tomlin is like Christian Wood. I think there's some similarities. Fair. He can handle the ball. I mean, there's some things that he does at that size that's pretty unique. But he's still he's still raw, but he's had some games. He had a game recently where he looks like you know, like he was he could be something. But I, I actually had him as a draft pick last year, and it just looks like you know whatever happened at K State, and it just kind of like killed his buzz and his draft stock. But I'm I'm high enough on him too. I think I want to do like a feature on him sometime during the pre-draft because he has a unique story as a guy that started playing basketball super late and yeah. went to JUCO and and so on. So I think he could be something with the right development. But David Jones has had like a huge breakout year, and I, I wonder he was at St. John's last year, right? Yeah, and and I want to say like to Paul. I think I know he transferred in the conference, but. Yeah, he's improved. I mean, I, I like to met DePaul for a second. And my notes that I hadn't touched in two years, just everything I was like, this is irrelevant. This is irrelevant. He improved all of it. So uh, yeah. I just I like that stuff a lot. And I think that's just says a lot to work ethic and just finding the right spot to maximize this game and truly showcase it, too. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about a guy as a freshman shot like 7% from three. And now he's up to 38%. But it's on a healthy volume yeah. of attempts, like six attempts per game. So he's had a, a really, really big season. Yep. Well, that wraps up this episode. This was fun. I knew you were the perfect guy to talk about the, <laughs> the, the mid-major prospects. And so we'll probably have to do another one in a week or so covering the NCAA tournament. Yep. So well, I'm looking forward to that. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow with Richard Saban. We talked about some of the top mid-major prospects playing in conference tournaments this week. Once again, it's Raphael with Richard Stamen, and we are out of here.